This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale Live demo at www.rationale-online.com. This is a Grilled podcast. Um, just so you know, there may be a few right words. So, Mum, stop listening. Um, but all you guys uh, carry on listening because it is fun. But there may be a few swear words because we're chefs at the end of the day and we like swearing. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat under roast whenever I want to eat under roast, not when you want me to eat it. I just remember Brad's smell of his beard. You just had a biggest, fluffiest beard, and I was like, God, he smells so good. <laughs> I don't know why, it's weird. Sometimes you put smell or something to it, and I just remember that, of course, a bit bizarre. Why are you in your chef's white cellar? Are you working? I'm cooking burgers. <laughs> oh, burgers. <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And I just lash it all over the hot toast as it melts and quickly munch it up, crunchy, crunchy, munchy. Dying to get like a piece of your culinary penis in or around their mouth. Welcome to Grilled, a podcast by The Stuff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Stuff Canteen, um, and this is the third episode with my co-host, Aaron Wallace, uh, former head chef of the Hand and Flowers, and now owner of a recruitment company, Tasty. Um, Aaron, since we last spoke, we've had Christmas. We're into a new year. How are we? Yeah, good, good. A few pounds heavier, which is unfortunate, again, for my uh, staff canteen hoodie. But, yeah, good. Yeah, really good. Looking forward to uh, 2022. It's a new year. And, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to uh, to see, you know, hospitality get back on its feet and everything's going to be super positive. Excellent. Well, on that note, introduce our guests and uh, why you wanted them on the podcast. So, uh, the guest um, this week is uh, a, a very good friend of mine, um, someone probably with the biggest recipe book known to man, um, the Flying Scotsman. He now has two Michelin stars over in California. Uh, it's Ian Scaramuza. Ian, welcome hello. to Grilled. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> don't go shy I don't say, I don't say American now. yet, yeah. I don't say an American yet. Are you working on it? No, I'm a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the opposite, actually. Um, so, firstly, I do. I mean, I've asked um, all of your guests so far this, Aaron. But um, how do you know each other? We first met at a. It was a charity dinner, wasn't it? Um, I think. Yep, um, Lombard Street. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. For hospital, was it Action Against Hunger? I think. Yeah, I think so. I think I was working for Claude and Andrew Fairley was doing the dinner as well. You were, yeah, because, yeah, you were, weren't you, um, you, you were a biscuit trying to make the sorbet for Andrew, weren't you? Yeah, I was trying to make sorbet for Andrew. I was doing <laughs> Andrew's dessert, mise en place, and I was doing mine and Claude's mise en place at the same time. So I, I got stitched up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so not yeah, stressful is... environment to meet each other then? Mm, no, was, not at all. Yeah, that was, <laughs> I when that, was, that was ages ago, wasn't it? Long piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was maybe 2012, 2013. Mm. Yeah, lots happened. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I mean, let's see how well you know each other. We're going to play two truths and a lie. Aaron, yeah. do you want to go first? I can go first, yeah. Go on then. Right, here we go. Uh, so, first one. Um, I cried like a four-year-old girl when we won two Michelin stars at the Hand and Flowers. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two is I got expelled from my last two days of uh, education at school. Um, and the third one was I was under 14s county figure skating champion. <laughs> I don't I don't know what I would actually say was a lie because anything you'd say, I would kind of believe it. If you, if you saw me now, you wouldn't think I could figure skate, I'll tell you that. Yeah, <laughs> I, would say, I would say obviously the figure skate would hopefully be a lie. Okay, is that, that's what you're going for? Straight yeah. in. Okay, Wait, Aaron? Am I messing around? Uh, yeah, that's a complete lie. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen him dancing. There's no way. <laughs> Even when I ice skate, I need one of those little penguins that you have to push around. I, yeah, I can't ice skate for Toffee. You said it so straight face though, Aaron. I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't sure. It's my, yeah, it's my, it's my poker face. I'm, I'm like it, it does worry me sometimes how easily you can lie. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, your two Wait. truths and a lie, please. Come on. Oh, two truths and a lie. This took me a while, actually. I was texting Ollie about this and asking him what he said. Uh, so, first one was I was expelled 
uh, I was uh, kicked out of school just before I was going into my hires. So I was like, I don't know what you call that in England, but it was like secondary school before I'd go to college. And then second one was I was asked to sing in the school choir. And the third one is I sell Bitcoin as a side gig. Can you, can you sing for me? I'm not going to sing for you. <laughs> <laughs> I husky your voice, it's early. Uh, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm going to go with Bitcoin. Yeah, that's, that's a lie. That's, that's the lie. That's, my, that's what someone else is trying to do on my Instagram right now, sell everybody Bitcoin and get some money off them. <laughs> I, got, I got hacked in Christmas Day. Yeah, you look like a choir boy, to be fair. Yeah, I was back in the day, but I said no. <laughs> <laughs> but I was asked. <laughs> I mean, Ian, you just said that, obviously, you, you, I mean, you pretty much started 2022 with a hacked Instagram account. I mean, a lot of people, that would be the end of the world. How are you dealing with the fact you've had yeah. to lose an well, account and start all over again? We got, I kind of had a bit of a shit week, actually. So the week of Christmas, I uh, had COVID. Uh, no symptoms, so I had to close the restaurant for the week. Uh, then Christmas Day, I got a message from one of my guys, a guy who used to work with me, so he was asking me, he's getting a reference for the Fat Duck, and I forgot to send the reference. And then I got a message from him on Instagram asking for my number, so I thought maybe somebody's going to phone me. So I, I sent my number, and then my fucking Instagram got taken off. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was my Christmas. It's good. And then everyone's messaging me saying, are you okay? Do you need some money? And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then they'll send me pictures and it's someone sending them, money, send, sending them fucking messages saying, oh, can you send me a grand? Or can you send me this? Can you send me that? And I'm like, what the fuck is this? But I, I can't get back into it. So you can't. I don't sell, I don't sell Bitcoin. Uh, <laughs> I wish I did, but yeah, there's some Nigerian out there still messaging everyone on Instagram, telling them that I need money and it's legit. So don't, don't listen to them. I got a uh, Michael Michael Bujanin sent me a screenshot, and he's like, "Is everything all right, man?" <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? And it's me asking him for fucking give me a grand, and you make ten grand in thirty minutes. And I was like, "No, nah, don't don't listen to it, man." So many people have just been messaging me asking me if, if I need some money, and so <laughs> you start a Venmo me later. <laughs> mm. So, I mean, what I mean in this, you know, the way that the world works now, that's that your account has to start from. Scratch, it is a bit annoying, right? Yeah, it's annoying. I mean, annoying because I used to obviously live in London and work in London, so I know a lot of people over there, and I'm kind of unknown over here. Uh, I lost a lot of, like, pictures and stuff like that, which I don't have on my phone, so there's a lot oh. of, like, food memories and all that. From my Instagram, it's not really personal. It's all about kind of work or professional stuff, so I lost a lot of that stuff uh, and just a lot of contacts, but, I mean, that's what it is. If, some, if, yeah. they, if people want to know me that much, they can they can get in contact with me some other way, I think. Yeah, yeah. It, so if anyone wants Bitcoin, yep. yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm you're their up. man. <laughs> <laughs> um, Angela Hartnett and Robin Hudson both got made OBEs uh, in the new year. Um, do you think it's good to see hospitality being recognised in, in something like that? Uh, for me, 100%. I, I think it's amazing. I think, yeah, even someone like Angela Hartnett, who she was, I think she was a judge in the Rue Scholarship when I won it, uh, She's kind of done a lot in her career, working from her time with Gordon to opening up her own restaurants, taking over the restaurants. And I think it's someone who's always been around and supporting other people and bringing up a lot of talent and stuff. So I think she definitely deserves it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Aaron? Yeah, 100%. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's loads of, you know, hospitality superstars out there that have, you know, been doing great things just, you know, a number of years. And yeah, like I say, people like, you know, Robin and, uh, and Angela are, are been doing it for you know donkey's years and that and you know they should be sirs and dames as far as I'm concerned like they're, they're incredible you know incredible figures of the industry so yeah more the merrier as far as I'm concerned yeah I mean they've really banged the drum for the industry over the past like 18 months two years haven't they so yeah, yeah. yeah. um okay Ian I mean you said you were gonna do this podcast from from the from the beach the pictures you sent me so you're in a very different location but Santa Monica how is it is life is good by the looks of it yeah so I was gonna do it from the beach but then when you sent me an email saying I had to be quiet I have to have 4g and wi-fi I was like fuck what if I don't she's gonna fucking go off her head and I have to come back so I decided to come into work uh to show you to show you the restaurant as well uh that's no, good I mean uh, I wasn't expecting to come to Santa Monica at all I was planning to come back to London last year, uh, 
in situ was always going to close, uh, COVID or not, it was a five-year contract. So it was a five-year lease. And then we weren't going to renew that because of the the restaurant and the way it was, the project. It was like other chef's dishes. And we thought that after five years, it would be enough uh, not to try and renew that. And it would just be boring eventually, I think. So I was looking at taking over a two-star in London. I was kind of all set to be coming over there. I put in my my notice. I had my lease coming up. Me and my wife were moving back. Obviously, COVID hit. And then... Uh, just everything just changed, timelines changed, all that sort of stuff went back and forward. And I was speaking to Corey Lee a lot about what to do next. And he just said to put my CV or resume, as they call it here, into recruitment agents and see what comes up. And a few things come up. There was a two star in DC that contacted me to go and take over as exec chef. Everyone asked if they'd been to DC, had no idea about DC. Uh, so I didn't want to go there. And I think if I was going to go that side, like East Coast, I'd be better off going to New York. And then I got contacted through William Bradley, who's the chef at Addison. Uh, he had contacted me. I thought that he was looking for someone for his place. He was actually putting me in contact with Josiah, uh, who obviously owns Melise and Citroen. Uh, and I just came down for two days. I spent two days in Santa Monica. Uh, and if you've ever been here or seen it, you see why it's, it's easy to, to come and stay here. And... Josiah had split the restaurant. So it used to be this two-star restaurant in like 2008. I think 2008 had two stars for two years and then recently left. So it's this huge restaurant doing like 110 covers or something like that. And he'd split it into what used to be the PDR. It's five tables. So it's 14 covers per seating. We do 28 covers a night. Uh, and just asked me if I want to come and take over it and kind of see what I can do with it. So we had no stars, uh, no staff. And his other side is Citroen, which is a separate team. It's a full team. It's a big, big restaurant. They do like maybe 100 covers a night and stuff like that. So fully separate. And I just kind of rolled the dice. I was like, fuck it. Okay, I'm going to try this. Because I didn't know Josiah. Never heard of him. Never heard of Elise. and Never heard of anything. And I came down and met him. He's, he's cool. Uh, kind of me, left me to it. Kind of gave me just that. It's like a platform, really. So I was like, okay, let's do it. Uh, I spoke to my wife. She didn't want to move back to London. She was happy in California, obviously. Uh, I mean, I so can't I, think why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I like London. I love London. Actually, I've always, I've always thought I'd be back in London sooner than I. And obviously, I'm not. I, I'm not yet. I always thought I'd be back sooner than I stayed here. And uh, I was like, "Fuck it!" So I came down here, spent a couple of days in Santa Monica. Obviously, the weather's really nice. I, I live half a mile from the beach. Uh, work life is always the same so the kitchen is always the same it doesn't change anywhere it's like the difference is your days off so when I'm in the kitchen I'm still in the kitchen 15 16 hours a day so nothing changes on that side which is great and then your days off is where it's different so I just couldn't say no there's no yeah. way I could change that so it's just really nice I stay I stay in Montana so it's like I live in Montana is like the nicest area in Santa Monica so it's like very very bougie very fancy uh and I stay like five minutes from work and then it's like 10 minutes from the beach. So uh, I can't complain. Living the dream, living the dream. And you're Sounds all right, Aaron, doesn't it? Yeah. Especially that tan as well. You're look, looking good. Yeah. yeah. It's not so bad that we had rain for two days and it was like the fucking end of the world. But uh, it's, it's nice, man. I can't, honestly, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to describe. You should come over and see me. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I will, yeah. It'll be on the next flight. That, yeah. Yeah, get get my booster and I'm out there. Yeah, that's it, man. you only need an antigen test to come into America, man. It's easy. It's just try to get into the UK. You need your PCR and stuff like that. So can I bring yeah. my dog? You can bring the dog, man. I've got I've got my dash with me as well, man. So they'll get on like a house on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I thought your dog was a bit of an ass boat, Aaron. Well, <laughs> He does. He, he's he, he wears a, he's wears a tag now, and he has he's on a um, <laughs> yeah. He's he's got a few restraining orders and, and, and bits and pieces, but you know, it's part and parcel of being a staffy, and it comes with the territory. So, <laughs> um, Ian obviously said um, that you went in there, uh, no stars, no staff. Congratulations on on obviously your your two stars, but how yeah. how hard is that to actually achieve? Um, you know, you can't, you don't just walk in there and then bang two stars yeah I mean so. I think it, it was tough because when I, when I came here I came and I had a menu written I told Josiah and he's got a chef partner Ken I told him this is what I was going to do 
uh, had my blinkers on, like obviously fully focused. I had no staff, so I spent maybe two weeks doing R and D alone, and then I inherited one of the guys from next door who's still with me, which is great. Uh, and we opened, so we opened after maybe three weeks of me doing R and D. We had one chef from next the other restaurant next door. She didn't last. She left me after maybe a couple of weeks. Just walked out one day, and then I lost one more. So I had essentially I had me and one more for the first four or five months, and we got two stars in four months. So it was quite quite intense. I've got no prep cooks, no pastry cooks, nothing. So I I I do everything. I touch every every single thing. Uh, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done actually because. Like working with Claude at Hibiscus was obviously a hard kitchen and you do big, big numbers, 50, 60 covers. But when you actually even do something as simple as saying 14 or 28 covers, it doesn't sound like a lot. But when you've got like a 16 course menu and you're touching every single thing, it's, it's pretty intense. So, uh, and it no. works to view as well. No, it's like it's you know, you work, yeah, I've nowhere to hide. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is Ian Scaramuza, this is your food on you know, and, and your name. Yeah, yeah, it's yours. Yeah, it's pretty nerve wracking. I mean, I, I, I was kind of confident in what I was doing, what kind of standard I was cooking at, but you still don't know. I, I've never seen. I think we might have had at least three, maybe four visits from Michelin, and and we only have five tables, and I had no idea, no idea of one of them. It's not like the UK where some people text you and or people know when they're coming, and you get some numbers or whatever. But we have no idea. So, I mean, I've, it's good that way, but at the same time, it's like. It's quite, quite nerve wracking because I knew the guide was coming out and I had no idea if I was going to be in it. So I kind of wanted to go zero or two stars. So that was kind of, that was the, the aim. Okay. Uh, and I was just kind of lucky. So how did you celebrate when you, when you, when you, uh, no, they actually, they, they stitched us up. So they came in and said that they were coming to do an interview with us for like produce. So I didn't know anything about it. We were just about to set up for service. They put me and Josiah on the camera and then they did the phone call. So they did the phone call and said, oh, just to let you know that Melissa has been awarded two Michelin stars. And I was like, fuck. So I turned around and fucking shook my guy's hand, uh, Justin, who was the, he's the only chef I had with me. Uh, and then they were like, oh, is that the only reaction you have? And I was like, I need to sell for service, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, enough, I had to cook some rice. And so I, was, I, was, I was very shocked. It was, it, was a, it was a hard one. And then I had to keep it quiet for like three weeks before it was announced. And I was in San Francisco because we closed for a week. And I was like seeing Corey and seeing a lot of friends and I couldn't tell anybody. So that was quite hard. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it, it was good. It was good. So now we're going for free and that's it. Okay. Go on. <laughs> <I'm bust. laughs> <laughs> you've already mentioned quite a lot of um you know some of the amazing chefs that you've worked with on your kind of journey to where where you are now I mean a lot of people look at us we talked about CVs last time I think Aaron or maybe it was with uh with Ollie but it's a hell of a hell of a CV that he's you've got certain, to get to he's that certainly point worked with a few um a few good chefs in his time like literally I if ever I was struggling for a recipe or I I, I thought of something I go I know someone who's going to have a recipe for this. And if it's not exactly what I'm looking for, it would be something very similar. Like this, he, he is the most OCD. Like if he ever, if if iCloud crashed and burned tomorrow, like I'm sure Ian's, you know, that's where all of his recipes, like it's incredible. Like the amount of recipes this guy's got is insane. And it's just so organized and it's OCD to another level. I've got two two external hard drives as backup, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> I never I don't play games with that shit. <laughs> and, they're, and they're in a safe. Yeah, it's in a safe, and it's only me and my wife has a password. <laughs> <laughs> but you're looking. I mean, looking back at you know at the people that you that you've worked with, was that um was it a plan or is it just how uh, it how it happened? You know, and now you're here two stars saying you want three was that always the kind of the end goal uh not at the start I think at the start when I was starting in Scotland it was Andrew was the one I always wanted to work with because it was only two star in Scotland and that was really hard to get in his kitchen back then you couldn't get a job because no one left because of the setup he had uh so then spending all that time with him the next stage was to go to France it was always to go to Paris I learned French I took French lessons every every week for a year on my day off and then Andrew got me a job at Guy Savoie, but I couldn't afford the rent because he was going to pay me like a, a commie and I was a sous chef at Two Star because I didn't have the language. Uh, that's when I ended up looking at London. And then I ate at Lastron's 
And obviously Claude used to work with Pascal at Larpege. Uh, and then I went down to Hibiscus and I ate there and it was brilliant. And I ended up going with Claude. So Claude was different. It was a good, that was my first head chef job. So that was five, I think it was like five years I spent with Claude, four to five years. Uh, could hardly catch my breath the whole time. And that was brilliant. <laughs> and then from there, uh, the Rue Scholarship was always something I wanted to do, but I couldn't do it when I worked for Andrew because he was a judge. So I had to wait. And then oh, I, the, I never realized that. Yeah, well, I, th- I don't know if they've changed that now, but because I was working for him and he was like kind of like the lead scholar and a judge, I don't know if he could be part of it or if he'd have to step, step away from judging that year or something like that. So I just left it. And then when I started at Hibiscus, I couldn't really do anything else apart from being in, being in work and think about anything else for the first two years, I think it was, or three years. And then eventually I was like, okay, I'm going to do this, Claude. And he was great. He, he would come in his day off and try my dish and all that sort of stuff. So I went there. And then I always knew when I was when I when I wanted to win it, I always knew I'd go to Bennu. Uh, and then I kind of told Claude I was going to leave and stuff like that anyway, because it's been a long time. And I went over for my stage looking for a job, but didn't obviously tell them I wanted the job. And they offered me a, a sponsorship after like the first week, so I was quite lucky on that. And then Corey took care of all that sort of stuff. So that was a, a huge process, but it took a year. It took a year to get the the visa, but that's because I got a green card. So, so from the start, I got a green card. Uh, so that took a year, but then that year was the, the kind of best year I had because I went to like Clove Club. I ran Wasted with Dan Barber. I did the R&D and op- start the opening for Claire at Core. So that's where I kind of met so much more people and seen a lot of more things because I wasn't just stuck in the same kitchen all the time. And so that was like one of the best years I had because I traveled a lot and met a lot of people and stuff like that as well. So that was, that was good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I remember that because I feel like you were here, there and everywhere whenever I spoke to you, like, oh, well, now I'm doing this. So now I'm doing this. Yeah, I was, I was doing so much because, like, Isaac had messaged me and he was just going out the 50 best. Uh, so Clove Club was going, I think Tim Sperring was actually just about to leave and uh, Chase was taking over. And Isaac was like, do you want to come in and help Chase take over? And then they, they were so busy after the 50 best that I had to, I was cooking the meat for like three months or something. So I ended up cooking and then he was opening Luca and I helped do the R&D and the opening of that. And then I was kind of bouncing back and forward from Clove Club to Luca and doing the wasted R&D and eventually I had to stop uh, Clove Club and Luca to actually open wasted. And then that was only six weeks, but then the the last day of wasted, the next day me and Claire went over to the Cayman Islands and we did two weeks over there. She was doing like some uh, private events. So I went over with her and then we did a lot of traveling. And at the same time, I was going to Gordon Ramsay's at the weekends when they were closed to do the R&D for core with uh, Claire and Johnny. So there was so much stuff going on, but it was, it was brilliant. I mean, exhausted. Now, yeah. Yeah. Now you've got such a big bloody recipe book. Yeah, it's got <laughs> just kind of collected everything along the way. But does he have a recipe for blue mashed potato though, Aaron? That is the Hopefully question. Not. <laughs> I've got the only. I've got the original one for that. I'm not getting into the one. <laughs> you don't want to know. I don't, I don't want to know about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ian, obviously, you mentioned um, obviously Andrew. Um, what are your standout memories from working with him? So you know, it was a, a real, a real loss to the industry, wasn't it? Where, when we found out that that was going to happen and obviously inevitably we did lose him so what was it like working for him and what are your kind of like uh, funny mean, memorable I, moments I think I mean I actually when I worked for Andrew at the start I was terrified and I think everybody who worked for him was kind of scared of him because of the way he carried himself so he never he never he never shouted at the kitchen he never shouted in the kitchen uh, I think I got shouted at twice and that was like what I can remember my whole time there uh one time he gave me shit because he thought I was out drinking with the guys the night before and I wasn't. Uh, so he fucking hammered me the whole service. And then he ripped me apart for having buns and marks on my arms. So he had to buy me long sleeve jackets. He was, he was crazy. But uh, no, he was brilliant. I think uh, more when I left, I got to know him a bit better. Uh, I had a night out with him. Actually, after that night, I met Aaron. So the night we met, me and Andrew ended up in a place where some people used to go after MasterChef filming, I think it was. Uh, I don't want to say this. I know, I know where, I, yeah, yeah, I know where you mean. Yeah. So yeah. I'd went there and then I ended up in O'Neill's and I think I got home at like five in the morning and I was white because I'd, I'd been started work at five, uh, six in the morning the day before. And my wife was like, what the fuck happened to you? Where were you? 
but it was Mr. Fairley. He, I had to fucking tap out. I had to say to him, I need to go, chef. Like, I'm done. I was fucking white. And... So, yeah, he was, a bit, he was a bit of a party animal when he, when he wanted to be. Everyone, you know, looked at Andrew Zoe as dead serious, like, super, I mean, he was dead serious and super focused at what he did. But I remember my fondest moment with Andrew was when he came, he came and stayed and ate at the hand. He was really good friends with Tom and Beth. Um, and we were in the ship, the local pub in Marlow. Um, just having a load of drinks and he, um, Michael Jackson came on he started doing the moonwalk and I was like, this is <laughs> Andrew Fairley. like this is Andrew Fairley and he's moonwalking through the ship in Marlow. I'm like, this is amazing. Like such a lovely, lovely guy. Like, yeah, just in, an incredible human being. Yeah, no, I agree. Man. I agree. I didn't know he was such a dancer. Oh, he had some moves. <laughs> yeah, he did have some moves. You had, to, you had to get a few whiskeys in him. When you got some whiskeys in him, then he changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, we mentioned the re-scholarship as well. Um, and we've obviously spoke to the most recent winner, which, which was Ollie. Um, he revealed there was a, there's a WhatsApp group for the re-scholarship as well, which sounded quite fun, didn't yes. it, Aaron? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it did, yeah, I'd like to see some of the messages in that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think I don't think Sat Baines is in it. I don't think he's on it. That's 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 one I think would make it a bit more fun. But I don't think Sat's on it. But there's I think the ninety percent of them are on all on there. Okay, and is it kind of a what is said in the WhatsApp group stays in the WhatsApp group? Uh, it's it's a little bit serious. I mean, I think because Ollie's been there, it's changed a little bit. He's he's a bit different, you know. So he's making it a little bit more approachable. <laughs> <laughs> and you said obviously you had to wait to do the Rue scholarship. So um, what was it like? to actually having waited to then actually do it and obviously achieve the ultimate which is to win it uh well i was it's crazy i mean uh, it, the people that do it and they have to or they don't win and they do it the next year and they keep on plugging at it like i've got more respect for them because it's it's hard uh i think doing it the first year i did it and i won it so i, I think i did it first time and i can remember getting through to the quarterfinals and I think it was when we were doing the dish so I did my testing in hibiscus and the day of the, the quarterfinals semifinals whatever you call it uh, you're supposed to take someone with you to help you with all your stuff and you have to bring all your equipment and, and we didn't have any staff so I had to get I had to go in and put away the deliveries in the morning at hibiscus and then get a taxi so that was hard and then when I phoned Andrew to tell him I got through because I think he was maybe in Birmingham I was when I got through the competition stage and I was getting accepted. I was like, yeah, I mean, at least I got through to the, the quarterfinals. We'll see what happens. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, you have to fucking go in there and fucking win it. He's like, yeah. He was like, what do, you, what do you mean you'll try it again? And I was like, all right. So that put a bit more pressure on me. Uh, and then the final was the same. It was like the final was around the corner from my house anyway. So I kind of walked around myself. So I didn't take any staff or anyone with me. So I kind of just rocked up with my box of knives and stuff. And I was kind of alone. So I don't know if that, intimidated anyone or else they just thought it was fucking crazy i thought, I thought you were gonna say it rocked up in your boxes no i mean i, I had some boxes <laughs> all right i'm ready let's go let's uh, i bet that's uh, never happened before <laughs> uh the, the final's crazy i mean because it doesn't matter who you are or how, how, how many places you've worked or whatever because they give you a recipe that you've probably never done in your life you have no idea and the year i won it was the last year when michelle and albert senior uh, we're both there and they were judging and I can remember Albert kind of hit me in the shin with my with his walking stick and telling me that I had to be on time because the two people in front of me were late and he walked over and hit me in the shin and he's like you have to be on time and I was like fuck okay <laughs> so, uh, it's pretty terrifying but when they actually said your name then was it take a bit of sinking in or was yeah I was kind of shocked and I think the way uh, Michelle Senior pronounced it it was like Yan or something so even like I had my mum in that in the crowd and they were like, fuck, who is that? And, then <laughs> like, and I was like, shit. And then they were telling me, like, you have to smile, but I was so fucking shocked. I was really shocked. I, was, I didn't really know how to take it's it. It's not your first name that they're going to struggle to pronounce, surely. Yeah, I know. That's why they just threw everyone off and said, fuck, you can't name it. Uh, no, it was crazy. crazy. So what, did, what did Andrew say? Because, you know, like you said, it was the, he said, well, you know, you've got to win it. So. Oh, so he, he threw me off because when, when we were getting into the actual awards and that's when they, they announced it, he wouldn't look at me and I was like, fuck, I've fucked this up. I've not won it. So he, he wouldn't give me any eye contact and I was like, shit. So I was trying to like just look at him to see if he was going to give me like a fucking a nod or he, he was like poker face. So I was like, I was terrified. I was like, oh man, I've not done this. And then I was thinking, how do I deal with it if I haven't 
one? Like, how do you deal with that? Uh, so I had no idea. I had no idea. And then after it, he came up and shook my hand and said, well done. Uh, and then I went out to a news with him and we drank Guinness until like from two in the morning or something. So I was moonwalking. Walking. <laughs> yeah, no, moon walking actually that night. I think he was like dancing with my stepdad. My stepdad's Irish. I think he was dancing with him actually at some point. Oh, okay. <laughs> he did. <laughs> sounds like, I mean, it sounds like an amazing way to celebrate winning, <laughs> winning the race yes. this year. Uh, what's it like in the, you know, where you are to get to get good stuff? I mean, we know, you know, we know it's it's a struggle at the moment to find, you know, good people and and you know, just fine people really that want to, you know, that want to stick at it and you know do you know jump into hospitality. Is it is it the same, you know, over the pond or? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I think honestly, like right now. Uh, no word of a lie, I have two staff. So I have one guy who's been with me since day one, and I just hired a guy who worked with me in situ. So I got him a visa. He's from Sri Lanka. Uh, he just got a J1 visa. Uh, we we use, like, uh, culinary agents and stuff like that, or I, th I don't know what the other uh, apps and stuff, but we try and get people in all the time. And I think even in LA, it's different. The, the staff, it's just different. I've, I've not had many people apply. Uh, I've tried on Instagram, like we've tried posting on their website, the, the restaurant's Instagram, and we just don't get anyone that really wants to come and work. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely a struggle. I'm still two staff. I think I should have, I could comfortably have five, so five plus me, uh, and we're still running that with two at the moment. So if you want to bring your, uh, your tasty over, over here, then uh, I'll, I'll sign up. Yeah. Maybe some people over here. I'll put my whites on and, you know, I don't know how long I'll last in your kitchen, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can come over. Well, I mean, it sounds like it's as, uh, as tough as it is, is here at the minute, though, doesn't it, Aaron? Because, I mean, you're, you're, not, you're trying to find people that yeah, you said just yeah. don't exist. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's super, you know, it's super tough for, for everyone out there. Not, but I think, <clears throat> I think once, especially once this, you know, the C word is, is, um, is out the way and we can you know move forward with that and, and there's a and there's a plan in action by you know bojo and his clowns one you know once that's sorted i think you know there will be a bit more movement i think people you know will then have a bit more confidence in okay well now I, you know i can find my next challenge or you know in those bits and pieces also maybe trying to get the europeans back um you know because you know they've you know they've left since uh, you know, since the world collapsed and, and they haven't come back. So I think we need to, yeah, there's, we d definitely need a plan in action in order to, you know, attract more people and, you know, and, and make it feel as though it's, it feels a lot safer to actually find a new challenge. Because at the moment people are like, well, if I move, you know, and there is a lockdown, what's going to happen? All those, you know, there's, yeah. there's so many variables at the moment that weren't there, you know, 18 months, two years ago. So yeah, it's, it's very tricky at the moment. But. And what's it like in London? Is everyone the same in London trying to find staff? And yeah, everywhere, like literally everywhere is the same. I've like, I've never, you know, pre-COVID, I know there was that kind of start, you know, there's a staff shortage, there's a staff shortage, but it's nothing compared to, to compared to what it is now. And it's not just, you know, it's not just your rural restaurants. It's, it's everywhere, everywhere is in the, you know, in that, in that situation. So it, yeah, it's super tough. Yeah, I think in my, my, my situation, the best thing for me to do is get J1 visas. So J1 visas, if you don't know already, is I can get them from UK or whatever, and they come over, they do one year. So it's like a one-year visa. Uh, and that's kind of the way it's working best for me. So obviously, i got someone from in situ who wants to come. Uh, I've got a guy, a Scottish guy, who's looking to come over, but he has to come over and do a trial. But that was kind of cancelled. He was supposed to go over this week, but that was cancelled because of COVID traveling and stuff like that I was worried in case there's given a lockdown so I told him it's not the best idea to come over just now uh but I think it's easier for me to staff it that way because there's more people who probably live in the UK that would be happier to come over and work in LA and work with me for a year and then they get a year in LA so it's mm. that's a draw for me I can tell them to come down yeah. and stay in Santa Monica and then they can work with me for the year and then that's it done so that's uh, what's, the, it, what's it been like um looking at the UK obviously from where you are at, through COVID but has it been a um, similar si situation for you or has it been quite strange to kind of follow the news and see you know what, what the UK has uh, been doing in comparison? No it is similar but I think what happened was America was a lot, lot later to 
to actually start locking down and realizing it was serious when it was serious. I don't know if this like Omicron shit is that serious because it's, I think it is generally a cold, but if people are getting sick, people are getting sick. So I, I don't know too much, but I think uh, I just noticed that the UK was a lot stricter at the start and then America was really strict, but then I was living in San Francisco. So San Francisco is that uh, we were wearing masks since like March when it was first announced that COVID and uh, we did takeout for Corey. So we did San Juan, which is his Korean restaurant he's opened recently. So we did a full year of takeout to do all the testing for that. So I kind of worked the whole way through, which was nice. Uh, so nothing really changed apart from you couldn't go anywhere and I had to wear a mask everywhere I went. But I was still mm. working. So I was quite lucky. I didn't have like the months and stuff off where everyone was making fucking sourdough and what was it, banana bread and stuff like that. I seen all that on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't very much, yeah. <laughs> so I missed that. I missed that. But I was watching it. I mean, it was it was hard to see. Uh, seen a lot of like friends and stuff, and see restaurants like struggling and like chefs actually having problems. You know, big chefs like Jason Athan, who's obviously a huge restaurateur, a great chef, and seen him struggling and seeing people like Claude and stuff like that doing takeouts and seeing people like that having to do that. It's uh, it's tough to watch when there's such like industry figures you know what i mean it shows that big like tom as well tom having problems and it's uh it's not nice to see people who are obviously so successful and that's that's when you know it's a problem and the most successful people you know in the industry are openly saying they're struggling on social media and stuff like that yeah yeah i mean if you look back at what everyone did it it, it is quite surreal really isn't it to think of what in the build-up to that to then them doing that 18 months of it was just so alien to everybody, wasn't it? So it was the boxes, it was the, it was so much, yeah. It was, uh, and I watched that, and I think that the UK were maybe a little bit slow to that because over in America, everyone pivoted to that straight away. So we were doing that for maybe three, four months, five months before it kind of latched on, and everyone in the UK was doing it. So I was kind of watching that. Yeah, there's a, there's other restaurants there. You no, know, it's been a, a very lucrative, you know, business fund. They, you know, they made great money from, you know, from doing doing boxes and they've also I mean there's chefs that have then gone okay well let's do this as a you know as a you know full-time full-time thing but then you look, also look at the amount that hospitality is given to you know to charity and, and, and also to the um the, all the meals for you know NHS and all that kind of thing it just shows how important hospitality is to to you know to not just the UK but the whole world it's like yeah it's it was incredible to see everyone just definitely you know, overlooked a little bit. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. It's not, yeah. and, and a massive bugbear for me is for the you know for the government to say that hospitality is a low skilled, you know, it's a low skilled job. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not like not in a minute. It's incredible to to do what Ian's done, like to do you know to do what Claude, Daniel, like all these incredible chefs. It's, how is that low skilled? It's like, yeah, well, it's, like it's, it's absolutely crazy. But you know, and to see, I, I'm very, I, I it's find myself very privileged to know people like Ian, to know people like Ollie, like Mark Birchall, the, the guys that have, you know, these three very good friends have all won the Rue Scholarship. They've all gone on to Ian's won two stars, Mark's won two stars. Ollie, I'm sure, is going to go on and do amazing things. Like, and it's, you know, these guys are incredible and they should be. You know, shouted about from the rooftops. Your journey within hospitality, um, Ian. We've talked about where you are now. Is there anything that you would have changed? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think uh, I think I would have maybe have came to America earlier uh, and worked somewhere like Benu or something when it first opened, or I would have went to France. I'd have been interested to see what I'd have done if I actually went to France before London. But I think when you work in London and you get to know London and you, some people don't last in London, but I think when you actually understand London and, and you get into the groove, I think it's an amazing place to work. So I don't know if I'd change it. I think I'd be interested to see if I'd done anything different if I went to France. I right. see what I've done from that. That's the only thing. But I think uh, a lot of people now are coming to America and I think it makes a lot more sense because there's not that pressure of learning another language and stuff like that as well. So yeah. I think it's a, a lot it's a lot easier in a way and there's a lot of different stuff to see and stuff like that but obviously you're further away from home but that's who cares you know what I mean? do you see it see yourself coming back to the uk to cook again or 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think if if it was ultimately if it was the really right thing, and there was like a an opportunity I really couldn't turn down, then I would definitely consider it. And I was so close to doing that last year or two years ago, whenever it was COVID started. Uh, but it has to be right. I think it has to be right. I think I, I can get my dual passport, so we can have like dual citizenship. I think this year, so it's maybe like in April. So after that, I can kind of do what I want. I could be back there and still come back to America. And, and that was a big draw for me to stay a bit longer because I was like four years in. And if I left, I was going to lose my green card. So green card lasts 10 years, but after five years, you can apply for citizenship and then you can have your dual passport. So it was a big thing for me to, to keep it. And obviously my wife has a good job over here now. So she's she doesn't want to move back to Scotland, for instance. <laughs> 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 I'd have to have a good case to move back to London as well because it's the same, you know what I mean? So I don't know. I think if it, if it was ultimately if it was uh, something I couldn't turn down, then I would come back. But it would be hard to find from where I'm at now. And what, about, what about you, Aaron? Are you happy you're out of the kitchen and doing what you're doing now? Or is it working? Yeah, no, it's like, you know, I'm, I do miss cooking. like, And I'll always, you know, I'll always miss, um, you know, the... You know the just the the banter and the, there's nothing like it in like in the world. It's like you know almost you know, it's like being on a bit of a building site. You know what I mean? It's like just everyone just having a a, a laugh and like and and the and the you know the camaraderie. But also I I, I miss I do miss being in the shit like and you know getting set for service and then you know going there like the sauce chefs overcook something so you've got to jump on and give them a hand and then the, you know the the larder chef hasn't turned up because i don't know he's overslept so you've got to you know we used to have to drive and go and knock on his door you know knock on the chef's door and go you know it's half past nine you're supposed to be in at eight o'clock in the morning like all those little bits and pieces like you miss because it's just it's nothing like it in the world but also coming out of it um and you know after 12 years of you know cooking at the hand of flowers I was I was pretty burnt out and I needed that time to figure out what it was I wanted to do and the more I more I was out of it I was like well what I want to do something I want to do something different but I want to do something that can bring benefit to the industry um and and I and I saw recruitment as something that can be done better I I think and and I don't think there's anyone that's you know, without, you know, without sounding like a, you know, blow my own trumpet that's cooked at the level that I cooked at and has, has done what I'm trying to do now. So that's kind of like the USP of I can, you know, I, I think I know, you know, I know the industry quite well and um, what you need to, you know, to be able to get to, to get to that level or to, you know, to cook at that level or to, you know, be within that environment so that's you know that's that those skills i want to use to tr you know try and get people to 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 where they need to be that's going to take off though once once everything's opened up properly i'm sure you're going to be really busy with all the contacts you know as well mm, yeah 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 i hope so i mean it's you know i've you know i was due to start this four days before the whole world come crashing down and i was just like oh shit like what am i going to do like this is but you know, it's a, a bit of a double-edged sword now. You know, now that it's back to kind of almost square one, and now it's just about building it, building it. And yeah, I never thought I would be, you know, I would have been, you know, doing the night shift at Morrison's supermarket, stack, stacking shelves for, you know, for a few months until my back gave way, and I realised how bloody hard, you know, people work in supermarkets, and that was a massive eye, eye opener as well, and something that, you know. I not necessarily wanted to do, but I, you know, I did. And I was like, Jesus Christ, stacking shelves, beers, wines, and spirits. BWS is called in the trade, guys. All right. BWS. <laughs> uh, honestly, my, first, day, first day I was there, this is completely random. First day I was there, they go, right, you're on BWS. I'm like, okay, thanks very much. Give me my green Morrison's t-shirt. Um, and uh, there was this massive palette of like vodka and gin and, uh, you know, a chef's dream really after service. And I, and I started to unwrap it and it just went like all over the floor. Like, oh my God, I tell you now, I will never, ever, ever drink Gordon's Sicilian lemon gin. It is, <laughs> the smell of it is rancid. Like, oh my God, it's disgusting. And it just went everywhere. Literally, I was just like, oh shit. Oh, it's, it's two in the morning and I've 
where do I find a mop? Like everyone's like, oh, it's over there, it's over there. So I'm like, oh, shh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> we said you missed being in the shit, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're being in the shit and then, yeah, trying to clean up, yeah, trying to clean up bottles of gin with shards of glass in your trainers. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ian, we've, we've talked about kind of your career highlights, but uh, what's the worst job that you've ever had? Well, see, I've, al- I've always just worked in kitchens, so I didn't do anything before that. I was straight in the kitchen. I don't really know. I don't know if I've had a worst job. I've had hard times in jobs, but I don't okay. know if that's the worst. What was your uh, first ever? You must have done a paper round, or you must have done a... No, no, actually, that's true. Actually, when it, when uh, my dad's an electrician, so my dad's an electrician, and he does like street lighting and stuff like that. So he used to take me out sometimes on a Sunday or a Saturday, and he'd make me dig fucking holes, and then I'd have to go down on my hands and knees, and it'd be in the rain, and and he'd give me like fucking ten quid for it. So that's probably the worst job I've ever had. I know, electrician in the rain. Yeah, outside. Yes. <laughs> yeah, electrician. He did like uh, street lighting and stuff like that. And my stepdad's actually an electrician as well. And I, I worked with him on a, in the summer when I got kicked out of school. So I worked with him and he used to make me run about and get all the stuff from the box and get his toolbox. And I used to fucking kick off. And that was that was me. I decided I didn't want to do that because I'd actually passed a test to become an electrician. And I was going to go to college to do it. And then I worked with him for the summer. And I was like, fuck that. No chance. Like He was annoying and... It was just like, I just wasn't just ready to be an apprentice like that. And then in the kitchen, uh, even though you're getting told off or whatever, I, I think I still enjoyed it better. You were warm. Yeah, it was better, man. It, was better. it, worked, it worked out better for me. You could have gone off and been an electrician, because I can't speak. And we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Yeah, not for me, man. Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we let you go, well, uh, we've talked about some of the other chefs that you've worked with. Is there any stories that you can share that they'd probably rather you, that you didn't share? Yeah, I, I mean, I have quite a lot, but I'm sure I'm sure Claude wouldn't be too happy. So I probably I probably shouldn't. <laughs> I won't mind. Oh, must be one. It must be one. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think I should actually. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's 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 he seems like he's much nicer now and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll just leave it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Aaron has as well. Wow, you know, I've got. Mm, yeah well pop yeah yeah a few i got a few but i mean i i got a few probably about me i mean the thing was when you know i don't want to end up being on hospitality bullshit and loads of people start jumping out of the woodwork saying that i was nasty because i wasn't i was very nice boss um (laughs) but going from so when the when i was at the hand there was there was never a head chef it was always tom um, back then, Tom was, uh, you know, six foot four, 30 stone bloke. And then one Christmas Eve, he goes, right, you're head chef. I'm like, okay, well, I'm best part of five foot 10 if I put my heels on and, <laughs> and n- nine and a half stone if, you know, it, on, a, on a good day. Uh, I'm probably about double that now after Christmas. Um, but I was like, okay, well... I have to manage this team of lunatics. How, what, you know, what management style do I use to get everyone to, you know, to toe the line? Um, and it was hard. I had, to, I had to find my own way of management because, you know, you had a, a huge bloke there, stood there. Everyone's going to, you know, most of the time, you know, sing off his, his hymn sheet. But then with me in charge, I was like, well, shit what do I do I'm like half the size of this guy and you know if they don't listen to me I'm I need to you know start giving some proper bollockings and I and I used that management style for a while until I realized it wasn't working and that's that was finding my feet as a manager there was a few things thrown um you know they chefs became very good at ducking um (laughs) and you know but until a time where I was like okay well this isn't working um so, and that's just a maturity thing as well, but, you know, shouting and screaming at people isn't, it gets, you know, it works to a point and it works for some people, but the majority of people are, you know, they don't want to be shouting and screamed at, like, because you're not going to get the right results out of, you know, out of, out of those, you know, out of those chefs. So, yeah, I was, you know, there were a few things that I've 
I, I did that I, you know, wish I shouldn't have done, like, you know, like throwing things, you know, getting upset, you know, giving people a dressing down in, in the walk-in fridge and Daniel Clifford walks in, like, <laughs> like all those little things. But it's, you know, for me, that was part and parcel of my, um, you know, growing up in a managerial role within a, you know, within a place that was, went from naught to a million, like that, like it was, you know, there will never be, I don't think there'll ever be something as, you know, that that shot to stardom like Tom and the Hand of Flowers that quickly. Like, yeah, you know, it wasn't an overnight success in in the fact that, you know, Tom worked all his life to get to that point, but the Hand of Flowers from, you know, 2005 to 2000 and let's say 13, 12, it just went absolutely, you know, wild. And it was like, okay, well, I've, you know, you're on this roller coaster. You've got to hang on and and and, and manage it as best you can. And that was a um, a learning curve for me as a manager, definitely. Ian, is that something you can kind of relate to? Is being a, a head chef, someone that who has such a presence in the kitchen, and you've then got to be that that person when they're not. Yeah, around. I mean, I think I, I think with me and Claude was different. Well, I'd worked with Andrew for five years, so if, if you if you knew Andrew the way he worked and in the kitchen. There was not there was not much shouting. It was all kind of silent expectation. Andrew would just stare at you sometimes and, and that would terrify people who'd watch you on service. And it was very organized. And then going to Hibiscus, Claude was unorganized in a lot of ways because he, he cooked kind of it was a lot off the cuff and a lot of stuff was done a la minute. It would be days where he changed dishes mid-service. And so for me getting into that, just trying to get my head around that was was tough. But then when me and Claude worked really well together because he used to tell me he wanted something then I used to I'd figure it out we'd talk about a dish or and I'd work on that and then he would come in on service and sometimes if he was having a bad day or he was like giving out to the guys and it was like what Aaron was saying I would be jumping on a section to make sure it was okay and he wouldn't direct to the guys he would direct to me and then I would just kind of put out fires most of the most of the time on the bad times uh, so it was kind of like good cop, bad cop a lot of the time. But then when Claude wasn't there, I switched into Claude because I was, that was his reputation. It was his restaurant. It's like, like Aaron's saying about Tom, he worked all that time to get to where he is. So when I was fully in charge and Claude wasn't there, I was acting the same as, as Claude would be. So I was, I was taking it that serious. So uh, yeah, it worked. And then when Claude was there, I just made sure that the guys were okay when, he wasn't happy with something or he had some problems or so it was uh juggling juggling a lot at the same time but i learned how to do it pretty well so it worked, worked <laughs> well just, just fine <laughs> uh, we, we did have him on a on a previous podcast and i did enjoy when i asked him uh, what disney character he would be his wife shouted that he should be eeyore which he was not impressed about at all <laughs> <laughs> and he said he wanted to be Mowgli which the idea of Claude as Mowgli just yeah. literally made my day because <laughs> <laughs> he does have a good fun side to him doesn't he like I think sometimes like he he has he has got a presence like when no one's going to deny that but he can be really good fun yeah I think if you if you know him if you work for him when you're younger and you're kind of coming up it's, it's hard to work with but I think when you get to know him he kind of changes fast, like he changes his, his mood fast, he changes his, he has fun, it depends on what's going on, And but he is uh, charismatic, is what I'd like to say, the best yes. way to say him, charismatic. <laughs> 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 right, final question, um, you've mentioned that obviously you were in that, you've had your two stars, now it's it's on to the, to the three stars, that's that's the goal, of what, is that it, that what's on the cards for you for the next 12 months, have you got a plan in place of what, what you're going to be I mean obviously you'll want some more staff as we've already discussed that would be nice we're we're going to we're going to sit down I think next week and start making a plan for anything extra this year uh it's just like refining everything seeing looking at what we can do better uh maybe looking to do some dinners and stuff like that maybe get some people over from Europe and do some four hands dinners uh we might do some dinners with some chefs in America we're looking to do some stuff like that and kind of not get the restaurant on the map. The restaurant essentially in LA is well known and in America it's pretty well known, but I kind of see like it's like it's a new era of the restaurant. So I think now I just kind of want to keep the momentum and kind of push on and it's just like everything. I was just going to keep my head down and, and focus and try and get better and see 
see how far I can take it as mm. fast as I can as well. So we'll see. I don't really know how to explain it, but uh, nothing changes. It's just that it's still in the same. I've still got my blinkers on and I just want to see how far I can take it. And, and personally as well, see how far I can go as well. So I'm pretty, pretty serious when it comes to my work and stuff like that. So yeah. everyone knows that. So, but that's why I'm, I'm quiet. I'm quiet on that sort of side. And I can, I, I just work and focus on myself and try not to focus on any other bullshit around me and social media and all that sort of stuff. Try not to focus on all that sort of thing. So I think, uh, I'll just see what I can do. I mean, it, it sounds like you very much know what you're doing over the next 12 <laughs> months. So, well, um, good luck. And hopefully uh, the next time I speak to you, you will have that that third star, which uh, you definitely deserve. And I'm sure Aaron would agree. Um, yeah. So thank you so much uh, for doing the podcast. You've survived. You've made it through Grilled. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and Aaron, I will speak to you for the next episode. Um, Ian, yeah. Thank you both. And I'll speak to you soon. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Thank you, man. Thank you.